Discover solutions to issues that affect your family and professional life with practical information to help you get past life's adversities. Take a proactive approach to power up your life with Rosalie's expert resources. According to Florida law, just about any property can be seized by police if it is suspect to have been involved in committing or attempting to commit a crime. Did you know that you can buy stolen goods for a fraction of the price legally? Most of these items are forfeited, seized, or found merchandise collected by police property rooms across the U.S., including right here in Florida. That's the Orlando and Tampa Police Departments. The police auction sites generates millions of dollars to give back to their communities. Retired detective Tommy Lane gave us some background on how Property Room came to be as an auction site. So I started thinking where could you get access to inventory uh, to be able to control the, the flow of product onto the site so you could uh, guarantee that product would be on the site. And I thought back to my days when I was a detective and I had to clean out the property room. I made a few phone calls. My friends said that not only did they, they still have that property that I had when I was on the police department, that they had more and more of it every day. So we uh, put together a business plan, went out and raised some money, and the uh, property room was started in 1999. So tell me, how do you collect the auction site items? We're not a peer-to-peer -peer auction site. We actually go physically pick the items up from police departments around the country, take them back to one of our warehouses where we do the description, we, write, we do the photo, photography, we do the testing of the items, we validate that it's real jewelry, that it's a real Rolex watch, that it's 14 karat gold. We have gemologists look at the jewelry and give us a, a ballpark pricing on the items. Then we put it up on the site, we auction it off, everything starts at $1, no reserve. When the winning bidder wins, we pick, pack, and ship the item to them the very next day. So what makes this site so different than others on the internet? Property Room is unique in that. We're the only, probably the only auction company on the internet that touches every item. Okay, so when we put an item up, we're standing behind that item. There's a company standing behind that item. We have warehouses in New York, Florida, Texas, Chicago, Washington and two warehouses in Los Angeles, as well as a client services division in Lexington, Kentucky, and another warehouse in Maryland for our coin collections. We have been trusted by 2,500 police departments to run our business ethically and, and honestly, and we take that very seriously, and we try to run a, the most honest and trustworthy website on the internet. We asked PJ Palomo, known as Chief of Steals for the Property Room, why is this a win-win for the consumer and the community where the goods were stolen or seized from? We pick the stuff up, put it up for auction, ship it out to the winning bidder, and then we've distributed over $50 million to communities across the United States. And 90% of the time, the money's not going back to the law enforcement agency it's going to the general fund of the community. So you go to propertyroom.com, you get a great deal, and you lower someone's taxes. Keeping our families safe from crime begins at home. Did you know 35% of U.S. families are raised by single parents? Here in Florida, we're up to 39%, according to the National Kids Count Program. And this is no laughing matter if you're raising an infant or a teen. Unless, of course, you're Jerry Trainer of the new family comedy, Wendell and Vinny on Nickelodeon. He joins us this morning with some interesting advice to share as an on-camera new single parent. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Rosalie. In the past 20 years, there's a sizable increase in the number of single parent adoptions. In your case, you fell into this, right? Well, unfortunately, Wendell's parents died. So my, my brother and, and sister-in-law passed away. We don't know how, we, or we don't talk about it in the show. Um, the show picks up sort of six months after they've already been uh, living together. And so Wendell's 12, and he's already his own person. And not only does Vinny not know how to be a parent, he didn't want to be a parent, doesn't know what he's doing. And, uh, and then Vinny has an older sister who thinks she would have been the be better caretaker. And so it makes for kind of an interesting sort of odd family dynamic. It's like a unconventional family. So do you think single dads are more or less strict in raising a child to adulthood than a single mom? I would imagine I would want to be the good cop in the, in the, in the thing and we would have 
But I suppose you'd have to be strict without the mom, you know? You know, Jerry, I think it's the same for just about every parent. We're kind of like an automatic pilot, not knowing really what to do, but just going by our own instincts. I don't know, in my family, my dad played bad cop. It was my dad, my dad was the, 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 the one we were afraid of, even though we're not afraid of my dad, but you know, my mom was like, we knew we could get away with stuff with my mom. But I right. feel like most of the guys I know that are parents now, they're just like, Ask your mom, ask your mom. Kids are brutal to each other, mostly in school. As teens, they're bullying and all kinds of negative influences that come from the kids around them as well as the media. So how would you try to help your child gain self-esteem? The truth is Wendell's a, a good kid. I mean, he's, he's super smart, he's a genius, super earnest, kind, sweet, like those things matter more later on. The problem is Vinny sees him getting kind of picked on and bullied a little bit. Um, nothing extreme, obviously, but uh, he wants to teach him how to be cool. And it's like, be like I was when I was a kid. Watch sports, play video games, go skateboarding, do anything, you know, that, that other kids like, because kids don't like homework and he loves homework. So it's one of those things. So, Jerry, do you think kids are smarter or wiser today than when we were growing up? I think they have to be. With the internet? I mean, there's so much information in their pocket. I, I mean, they, they know everything the moment it happens. The news, the, the media, pop culture, everything is, is, is in their mind in a flash. And they, and I mean, it's, I'm, I'm fascinated to see how that's going to shape culture moving forward just because I mean, how we process that information is going to be very interesting. Why should parents add a little humor into every day's serious life events? Uh, I mean, for me, comedy, humor, laughing is, is the, is, that's the way I deal with most things. I mean, it's, it's how we get through life. I mean, if you focus on the negative, it, I mean, it could just drag you down like a stone. Um, and I think that's the power of laughter. I think it, it gets us, and that's why the show, I think, I think people will connect with the show because yes, there's this shared tragedy that we all have, but we get through it with the humor. I mean, that's how we find common ground. That's how we connect. That's how we move forward. And that's how we learn our life lessons, Jerry. Thank you, Rosalie. This is one amazing truffle tree. Can you imagine a place where these grow everywhere? Yes, it's called the forest, a magical place to enjoy with your family. Ooh. So discover the forest and explore all the wonder that's there. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. percent of U.S. children ages six weeks to six years old spend some time in childcare where dangerous germs are easily spread. The risk of spending time in a daycare or preschool settings are the same. The constant sharing of toys and furniture and frequent hugging and hand holding and eating and napping and dropping food on the floor and sharing them in closed quarters makes daycare an ideal environment for infection spreading among young children, especially young babies. Here with tips for working parents that should know this about the risks of illness in daycare and what you can do to help prevent them are Dr. Paul Kekia and parent advocate Heidi Stotz. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. 
Doctor, may I start with you? Tell us about the risks that childcare settings present for babies and for preschoolers. Well, as you already mentioned, uh, the vast majority of children do spend some time in daycare. Um, but that, while that's a great environment because they get socialized, they get to meet new friends and, and have a lot of fun and get educated, um, those viruses do pass from one to another. Um, right now during this season, the virus that gets the most press is influenza, but there are other viruses like respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. There are viruses that cause pink eye, that cause gastroenteritis. All of those travel in the same pack because they are spread from child to child. Um, and for example, RSV, that virus can live on surfaces such as toys or countertops for up to 24 hours after a child has touch, touched them. So they're, they're rather resilient viruses. Tell us more about RSV and what we can do to help protect our children from this. The best thing that we can do is to wash our hands. Uh, not only wash our hands, but make sure and we teach children to wash their hands well, uh, clean surfaces, disinfect toys at the end of each day or as many times as possible. Um, and really for most of us, RSV, for example, um, will lead to just a bad cold. Uh, we'll get over it. Uh, but for young infants, infants at risk, whether they be premature, they have immature lungs, uh, whether they have congenital heart disease, those are the kids that it can lead to life-threatening uh, illness and can unfortunately end up uh, in an intensive care unit being cared for by somebody like me. Heidi, share with us your experience with daycare-related illnesses and RSV. Well, uh, about six weeks after my son was born, I, like many new parents, um, needed to go back to work. And so he was in a daycare facility and um, he experienced a very severe attack of RSV, which I was not familiar at all with RSV um, until it happened to us. Um, he had a very, very serious reaction, which went, um, fortunately I had a great daycare who was keeping me informed. And as I, I went to go pick him up from daycare, he started um, losing his color, which ended up with them calling 911. Um, he went via ambulance to a local hospital where he um, had to be intubated, was had coded at the hospital, um, went flight for life over to Children's Hospital of Wisconsin and spent six days on a ventilator. So um, we had a really happy ending, but now I look at this as our opportunity to help create awareness for other parents and get the word out there because it's it's not as widely known about as it should be. As a parent advocate, Heidi, how do you create awareness amongst other parents on how to prevent the spread of germs that can cause illness in RSV? Well, I think like many other, of the other contagious illnesses out there, I, there are a lot of the same policies that you really want to follow. Um, frequent hand washing, making sure that any visitors um, who want to touch your baby or get near the baby are washing their hands. Having a frank discussion with your daycare provider about their um, cleanliness regimen, how they disinfect and um, keep that virus which can live for 24 hours on a, on a surface from spreading. Knowing that is, is very powerful and also um, visiting a site like rsvprotection.com is very informative and it'll teach you a little bit more about symptoms to look out for and again just be trusting your gut and really watching for those signs and making sure that you're in touch with your physician about any questions you might have. How do parents determine when to send their child back to school? And because that's a balancing act that is very important and we need to get back to work. That's right and you know I think if we look at it from the balance of saying there's a team that is trying to help raise our children together um, and we're part of that team and one of our responsibilities is to know when our children um, are safe to go back into that environment. Um, as with any virus, if you're febrile, uh, that's definitely a time to keep them out of daycare. Um, but for example, for RSV, it's a little more difficult because the virus is still shed um, from nasal secretions um, for several days afterwards. So the CDC actually recommends three to five days after fever before you can send your child back into a daycare setting. Uh, but it's really being cognizant of trying to balance um, both those competing interests. So where can we find more information? 
Well, first I would say start with your primary care physician. Pediatricians are very knowledgeable about RSV. Um, there are a couple of great websites, uh, one put on by the American Academy of Pediatrics at AAP.org, uh, but there's also, as Heidi mentioned, rsvprotection.com, which is really focused only on RSV education. Average planning for a full-time student enrolled in a Florida college system is about $14,688 per year, or figure it this way, $58,000 in four years. More when we return. When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified, not knowing what to do they do nothing. But the people who take action are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making home affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Protecting our children also includes academic planning for our children's future when they're in grade school. Helping to ensure our children reach their potential by achieving their academic goal is a huge investment for a parent that will give them peace of mind when it's time for their retirement. A National Gallup and Sally May poll of college students and their parents released last August reported only 9% of parents had tax-free 529 college savings plans. Though two-thirds of the U.S. college graduates are burdened with an average of $19,000 of student loan debt. Families save in more flexible accounts like checking accounts, but they don't get much interest. When they could be at least putting some of that money over aside in a, a college education related fund, their money can actually work for them. Individuals with a bachelor's degree have weathered the recession far better than their less educated peers. So you have to make sure you've got a good plan to pay for college. If you borrow, borrow reasonably. The most important part is getting the degree. Students who drop out and don't finish their degree and have taken out loans are four times as likely to default. For more information on college investment plans, go to sallymay.com or myfloridaprepaid.com. Florida ranks 18 in the nation in injuries, resulting in 12,000 deaths per year. Accidental and violent injuries are the leading cause of death for those ages 45 or younger. According to the Facts Hurt, a joint report issued by Trust for America's Health and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. For those who live through an unexpected illness or injury, a serious medical condition can result in thousands of dollars of out-of-pocket expense, such as co-pays, deductibles, transportations for doctor visits, childcare, and much more. To help you and your family prepare for an unexpected health care issue, personal finance expert Manisha Thakur joins us with some simple tips to establish an effective long-term plan to protect us against health care skyrocketing costs. Good morning, Manisha. Good morning, Rosalie. So what are some typical out-of-pocket costs for common illnesses and injuries? The first thing that I want viewers to know is that Major Medical was never designed to cover absolutely everything. And as a result, a lot of us don't know the true cost of something from a broken leg to, to something more serious like a stroke or, or breast cancer. Um, and examples of these kind of costs can include things like um, transportation to and from foul up medical care visits. Um, supplies that you might need, uh, crutches, a wheelchair, uh, extra bandages as you're recovering. And then on top of this, um, let's just say you work in retail um, or in the service industry and you've got a broken leg and you're literally unable to work. Your rent still continues, your car payments still continue. And so there are these imputed expenses a lot of us don't realize. But if you go to this neat website called Get the Real cost.com you can play around with various illnesses and injuries and understand for your situation the true comprehensive cost 
um, outside of your major medical um, of, of common injuries and ailments. Yes, and I was amazed. Like having a heart attack can cost over $65,000. And a broken leg, $10,000. Rosalie, and here's a really stunning um, set of statistics. Aflac has done um, a workforces report um, study that shows three stats that I just have to highlight for viewers. Number one, 40% of us would have to rely on the three Fs, family, friends, or 401k, if we were hit by unexpected medical costs. And the reason is 25% of Americans have less than $500 in savings. And 46% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. So you can see those extra costs that major medical was never designed to cover can really take a bite out of your finances if you're not prepared. So what are some of the specific costs that major medical insurance companies normally will not cover? Say you're diagnosed with um, diabetes, a recurring ongoing condition. Um, depending on your circumstances, that could have a price tag, a total comprehensive price tag all in um, of over $11,000 a year. So where do we start in the planning process to prepare and cope in the event we have a medical emergency? Absolutely. Tip number one is engage in any wellness program that your employer offers. It not only can lower uh, health care premiums, but it also can make you feel better. Uh, tip number two is to take advantage of the preventative care that is currently offered. Those annual and semi-annual exams are vital. Tip number three is really those savings stats I highlighted. You want to build up that savings cushion, even if it's just an extra 10 or $15 a week that you can add to it. It makes all the difference. And then tip number four is to visit with your HR benefits department. Really understand your major, med your major medical policy. Understand what it covers. So then you can identify what are the gaps and then you can decide does voluntary um, insurance make sense for you to fill in those gaps. So those four steps taken together uh, can really help reduce stress that comes with unexpected medical costs. Thank you, Manisha, for all your tips on how to protect and prepare our family for the rising cost of health care. Thanks, Rosalie. Rare diseases are not so rare. Actually, more than 30 million or one out of 10 Americans suffer from one of the 7,000 identified rare diseases. Joining us to discuss the signs, symptoms, and options of rare disease is Dr. Erica Herzog, pulmonologist and Yale University professor. Doctor, you've received numerous research grants to study rare lung disease. Tell us about your work and the patients you help. And my research is focused on finding new ways to understand IPF so we can develop new therapies for patients suffering with this disease. IPF, as you probably may know, is a rare disease characterized by scarring in the lung, and this makes it very difficult for patients to breathe. It's poorly understood, it's often misdiagnosed, and we have really no available um, FDA-approved drugs to treat it. Therefore, most patients die within about two to three years. When a patient comes to you with a rare lung disease like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF, how do you identify this rare disease, and how did your patients contract this disease? Well, to, to answer your last question first, we don't know why patients get IPF. When a patient with IPF or potential IPF is referred to our center, um, I or another one of the IPF physicians will, exam will take a history, examine the patient, then we perform tests such as pulmonary function tests, um, we do a CAT scan, and then all of the IPF doctors, probably about six or seven doctors, meet in a multidisciplinary conference and review the patient's case where we then will determine that the patient does have IPF and talk about what available treatments may exist. Is there a specific age group or part of the country that IPF is more relevant? It's, there's, no, there's no geographic uh, proclivity for the, for the disease. Um, it happens mainly in older patients, so patients older than 50, and as patients age, you, you do see an increase in IPF. Can smoking cause IPF? 
Patients may have smoked several years prior, but smoking is not thought to be the main factor causing IPF. So what is the distinction between IPF and COPD? One of the distinctions is that we know what causes COPD, smoking. Um, another distinction is that there are drugs approved to treat COPD, certain inhalers that, uh, your that people frequently take. Um, COPD and IPF, IPF affect the lungs in opposite ways, and therefore they're, they're sort of opposite ends of the same spectrum of bad things happening to the lung. Learn more about IPF. Go to www.pulmonaryfibrosis.org. Today's resources focused on planning for the unexpected, taking sick time off from work to care for a child, a loved one, or yourself due to an illness, rare disease, or injury. This can result in spending down your life savings. Life is full of surprises, so take the time to get your personal finances in order to establish a long-term plan that protects you and your family. Your health is your greatest asset, so stay germ-free as much as possible by frequent hand washing and caring for your lungs. Share your unexpected experience with us on Facebook forward slash Rosalie or rosalieartershow.com. See you next week right here on ION. Will the solutions to this show's issues help you or a loved one? Find shows like this and others on our website at rosalieartershow.com. Thank you.